I knew nothing about publishing. Mm. Um, and I, I thought, I, I finally got a job at Penguin. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be an editor or something like that. I'm going to go out to lunch with famous people and I'm just going to give them a few words of advice. But so I got there and they gave me this effectively giant puffing costume to wear. And they said, your first job is to go out to schools <laughs> dressed up as this giant book eating monster and like have fun. And I thought, well, this is not kind of what I thought it would all be. But. Again, it was all it was about watching kids because I don't know, Robin, if you've ever been a giant costume character, but actually it's really, really important experience because you become this kind of anonymous friend of childhood and you're big and you're friendly and you're nice, but they don't know who you are. So they hold your hand or in my case, claw and, and they tell you all their secrets. So I was a bit like an author. Um, I was a secret friend of children, children, really. And they told me what they liked. They told me what their best friend liked. They told me about their kind of hopes and dreams. And it was a really, really good introduction to why stories are important for kids. Um, because they told me about the stories that matter. And it wasn't just, um, it just wasn't ordinary stories. Because sometimes books are the only friends that children have. And they're their secret friends. They're the friends that they keep in their bedroom. They're the friends they have under the pillow. They're the friends when things get really tough at school that they read on their own on the bus. And they help them in really, really important ways um, about what Roald Dahl used to call valor. Barry, I teach children valor. And they're teaching him stuff about facing up to difficulties and how you get by with the help of your friends, sometimes with your family, sometimes not, sometimes with adults, sometimes not with adults. So I kind of learned all that stuff when I was a giant costume character, really. He told me one day that he said, do you know about laughter, Barry? It's my terrible impression of Roald Dahl. He said, um, do you know about laughter? He said, you know, in some ways, you know, he said, somebody told me that laughter was delayed fear. And, do you know, that's really <laughs> informed a lot of what I think about children's books. And if you think about the way that Roald Dahl and the other great children's writer use laughter and humour, it's one of the things that makes British books so distinctive and so powerful. Because if you're powerless, and often children are, and that's also why they associate with animals, because animals are often powerless and controlled by adults, and that you're moved around, you're said, here's your new daddy, here's your new school, you know, we're going on holiday to somewhere you don't want to go to, you're going to leave all your friends behind. If you feel powerless, Often the only weapon you have with dealing with that is humour. And if something bad is happening to you, somebody's being villainous to you, what's the one thing you've got? You can still laugh at them. You can still make fun of them. You can still make the horror of the situation dealable with if you say, I'm not taking you seriously. You're a moron. <laughs> and, you know, that's... It sounds like a simple lesson that children's books are funny and children's fantasy... The best children's fantasy uses humour in a creative and interesting way. But actually, I believe it's a deeply important reason why British fantasy is so successful. So it's one thing to recognise the talent. And you talked about reading habits. It's quite another thing to not only sell a talent, but also, in a sense, go against what the current feeling is on reading habits. Is that something we're also particularly good at in, in Britain? Yeah, I, I think you can make up all that kind of musical stuff about Britain and why we're good at, at, at recognising new things, you know, and we're good at inversion. You know, you could say that everything from the mystery plays to Monty Python is all about taking something and turning it on its head, you know, um, making a joke out of something serious. Because again, that's the way as a nation we deal with stuff. And we love dressing up, don't we? We love dressing in funny costumes and women's clothing. And inversion is from pantomime dames to, you know, comics on television we love that whole thing of taking something very sensible and making a joke out of it but also making a serious point about how it's not really sensible you know 
And I think it is a big heritage that we have, all those wonderful stories um, about, you know, children and changelings and things left in the night and all that. And we add this somewhat British sense of eccentric humour and inversion and we come up with our ability to want to go to different worlds. Children are marvellously unconventional in the way that they'll follow stories, you know, from giants to to miniature people, to horses that can fly. You know, that they, they want to come into those worlds and live. But what you were saying was really interesting earlier. They want to live in those worlds with rules. So you have to have a firm framework of what is and what's not allowed. I used to work with a very famous penguin author called, um, editor called Kay Webb, who was one of the earliest Puffin editors. And she said, you can get away with one big lie you know, you'd be very small, very tall, go to the back of a wardrobe, you know, and go to a magic school. But after that, everything has got to be really, really organised because, you know, that's the way that children want to know. And she said something which I think is very important and it's one of my great secrets of writing for children. She said, you've got to tell them what they're going to have for tea. In the mid-90s, you were handed a book by an unknown author from Scotland or who was writing in, in Edinburgh and 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 that obviously became the worldwide phenomenon which is is Harry Potter was there something of that um, legacy the Roald Dahl legacy or the legacy of humor in that that that, that struck a chord when frankly nobody else um, I believe nobody else had picked her up yeah it's an extraordinary story isn't it I mean it's one of those unbelievable things that you can't kind of almost imagine has happened. Um, and in fact, Joe Rowling, years later, um, rang me up and said, um, I had a dream about you the other day. And uh, I said, well, that's really nice. And said, no, so I had a dream that you never took the book. Um, uh, and that, you know, um, it never happened. This whole thing never happened. Um, and it is, it is like one of her stories in a way, what did happen because yeah, I got, I got the first Harry Potter book, um, brown paper envelope, um, one night from an agent that I had a little bit to do with before. And, um, and he didn't tell me, agents never tell you, Robin, that 23 other publishers had turned this down. I noticed that the pages weren't exactly fresh, you know, obviously it had been read before. Um, and I read it that night and I, I, I had absolutely no hesitation for some of those reasons, really. Um, I liked it because, do you know, I, obviously I liked Hogwarts and I liked the owls and I liked all that, but I really liked the friendship. I liked the friendship between the characters that got them through it all. And I loved the way they used the humour. And, you know, if you laugh at danger, we often... Um, we often cry with happiness on the other way around, don't we? We often, when we're really happy about something, we cry, we're upset because we're so happy. And it's those kind of emotions that I thought, you know, would really, really um, affect children reading the book. But I'm fundamentally, I'm an entrepreneurial publisher. I buy things. I'm a buyer, not a cooker, as we say in the business. So I buy stuff to sell to other people and help and I'll edit it to make it sell better or to appeal better. But um, I don't, I don't. Um, so the first time I read a book, I find it incredibly difficult to have a critical view because I just read it as a story. And at the end of it, I think, well, does that really work or not? That, it, it's bizarre, isn't it, hmm. that you've got the biggest phenomenon in, in children's books, Harry Potter, coming from a, a, a single woman's imagination on a long train journey, and, and there was no marketing consultants, no focus groups, nothing like that. None of them come out of um, think tanks. They just come out of a deep connection with writers with children's imagination, and that's what I think we should all be about, and that's why we're strong. And they're not really meant for adults. They're not meant to provide um, the level of, of um, uncertainty or the level of sexual complication. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're really um, about some very straightforward values, if you like. And if you had to pick one, it would be love and friendship. Um, and the terrible fear of losing things, of losing someone that you love, losing an animal that you care about, that most awful thing in children's books, which is you lose a parent. 
Um, they're about those kind of issues which are really important to children and I don't believe they're quite the same issues.